Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, all right. So I'm going to begin lecturing. I hope the exam went okay. Um, just some um, announcements. So let me, let me just show the board real quick. Um, so the exam next week, and obviously I'm not going to lecture after, after the exam, um, will be on chapters 34 and 39. So one problem from th chapter 34 and one problem from chapter 39. And it's going to count half your regular exams. It'll also have some uh, multiple choice short answer questions. And they'll be more, more like the standard problems that uh, um, you would encounter, mainly because um, we're covering the material fairly quickly. And the nature of the material in, in these two chapters, you really can't ask questions that go beyond. I mean, to, uh, it's really hard to ask on standard questions. And so, um, they should be pretty straightforward problems, I think. Okay. Um, so two problems. So I'm still going to give you two hours for the exam. Um, you'll probably get done a lot faster. It'll be a lot shorter exam. That's why it's only worth 9% of your grade. And the other reason too is because we're in this online mode. Um, and I'm sure you guys have a lot of exams next week. So I figured I'll make this exam short. Uh, but you do have a lab that's due December 11th, and so uh, please make sure you get started early on this lab. And um, the lab kits, return the lab kits um, by the 16th. So there's going to be a box in front of Sewell Hall. You just got to dump them in the box. So when you drop off your lab kit, there's a, this is a lab you're doing, right? This is, you, you return everything. It's a 20-point lab, so if you return everything, you get 20 out of 20 on this lab, so it's a lab you should get 100% on. Uh, return the return the kit, and I sent you an email with what you what you need to return. It's main, most of it's just the instrumentation, the instruments that you used. Okay, um, put them in a box if you can. Something sturdy. Uh, make sure your name on it, because I have to give you credit for this. And if I don't know that you gave it back, then it's hard to give credit for it. So Tyler will be picking up that stuff. Okay, you put it in the box, Tyler will pick up everything. Is that clear? And I'll make this announcement yep. in the lab on Monday. Okay. So really, once you're done with the LRC lab, you can turn everything in. But I'm giving you, I, I want to I get it done by the, I want you to get it done by the 16th so that I can, uh, process who has dropped it off and uh, process your grades. So the grades, the final grades won't be assigned probably till the Friday that they're due. Okay. Because I still have to grade two labs, several exams. Okay. Um, any questions regarding this stuff? All right. So we're going to do a short uh, discussion over the next two days on relativity. Really, if I wanted to cover this well, um, I would probably do maybe six lectures on this topic. And I never have time to, I've never had six lecture, enough time for six lectures. I'm going to provide you some links to some videos um, if you're interested, because it's a fascinating topic. Um, there is, recently there was, there's a famous a uh, physicist slash math mathematician named Brian Greene. I don't know if you've heard his name. And he's, he's in a, at an elite college on the East Coast. Maybe it's Columbia, I forget. Well, he produced a, um, basically a course on relativity. And your only knowledge of math that you need is high school algebra. And, and I saw some of it. It's, it, it, it. There's a YouTube on video on it, a YouTube video up on it, and I'll give you the link. You're not going to be able to watch the whole series between now and the end of the semester because it's 11 hours. But some of the examples he gives are great. I mean, I, went, I only went through the first couple hours. I, I kind of jumped through it. 
And his examples are great. They would be great examples for you to look at. And he gives a very simple explanations to a very com it's logically complex topic. You'll find that the math in the subject is not that complicated, but the logic is. Okay. So I'll provide the video. And then the other videos are from this guy from Yale who does a series of four lectures. You probably just need to look at the first two. Um, and that kind of at least gives you a nice perspective of relativity. I'm only going to do um, this material, and then on Monday, I'll talk about some kinematics. Okay. So let me start. Um, there's a lot of history behind this, and I'm going to give you kind of like a synopsis of it. So what I'm, anything I'm doing here is, is incomplete. I'm just going to give you some sort of synopsis. And so, you know, first of all, why, why am I covering relativity in, in this course? And, and, and the, reason why, the reason why is because Einstein developed the idea of relativity because he was looking at the laws of e &M. He was looking at Maxwell's equations. And his, when you, if you read his paper, all this paper's in German, but if, if you were able to read his paper, um, he, you know, he's thinking about making the laws of e &M consistent with uh, basically transformations going from one reference frame to the next. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the origins of thought. I'll talk about his principle of relativity. And, now, and then I, I, I want to finish off then with the idea of simultaneity and synchronization. And in that, in that I also talk about time dilation and length contraction. Okay. So I want to begin with something that you learned in Physics 205. You probably covered it for a little bit of period of time. Everything in physics is relative. I mean, when you talk about speed, for example, speed is relative, velocity is relative. It's always measured with respect to something. When you talk about the motion of a car, you should really say, uh, if you want to refer to its velocity, you have to refer to its velocity with respect to the ground. Okay. And so the idea is, you know, uh, we want to look at the laws of physics between different reference frames. So let's go back and try to look at the basic Galilean transformation, which you've probably seen in Physics 205, but it's okay to go through it again. So suppose we have two objects. Well, let me rephrase it. Suppose we have a moving bus. Okay, suppose we have a bus and the bus is moving to the right. And I'm making my discussion one dimensional, but this would apply to two and three dimensions too. Okay, so let's say we have a bus that's moving to the right. That's not a good bus, but that's okay. And we're going to say that the coordinate system of the bus is represented by the prime frame. And this bus is moving at a velocity v relative to us. So let's draw us, let's draw a coordinate system for us. We're the observer. So the bus is moving relative to us. Or you can actually say that the, we're moving, the a person on the bus is going to say we're moving relative to, uh, to them. So here you are. You're, you're there. And so the origin for the, the, the back end of the bus uh, the, uh, is the origin of this coordinate system. Suppose I... I'm in the back of the bus, and I throw a ball. Let's say I throw a ball horizontally. And the location of the ball on the bus at some time, t, I'm going to call it x prime.
And this is at some time t, okay, at, in its motion. I've thrown it horizontally. Let's not worry about it. We know it's going to fall downward, but let's just look, look at the x-coordinate. At some time t, the bus is a certain distance away from us. We'll call v, v times t. The question is, according to this person, according to us, what is the location of the ball according to us? And so you'll say that the ball is at a distance x prime plus v times t at an instant in time t. Does that make sense? And this is the Galilean transformation. This represents the position of the ball in the moving frame relative to this person. And of course, to the ball, the observer can be written, the observer position can be written this way. That's the position of the observer. Okay, I just gotta I just gotta resolve this. Okay, so this this would represent the position of the observer relative to the person here. Okay. Questions so far? So Let's take a look at how fast the ball is moving relative to this person. Okay. Let's take a look at how fast the ball is moving relative to this person. So I threw the ball, so I threw the ball horizontally with some speed. And the bus is moving at some speed. And you guys know, you folks know that if I'm on a bus moving to the right, let's say the bus is moving at um, 10 miles per hour to the right, and I throw the ball to the right, with a velocity of 10 miles per hour relative to the bus, you're going to measure, if you're stationary, a speed of the ball equal to 20 miles per hour, isn't that true? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, if I take a time derivative of this, then I'm going to call this the velocity that you observe is equal to the velocity. I'm going to use u for the velocity with respect to the reference frame. Okay, so the velocity with respect to your frame is going to be the velocity of the ball with respect to the, uh, the bus plus the speed of the bus. And that should make sense. And the bus is moving at a constant speed. Now, if I take another derivative, then this gives me the acceleration that I would measure with the acceleration of this guy with that, that I would measure with respect to uh, my frame. And this represents the acceleration of the object with respect to this frame. And since the bus is going at a constant speed, this derivative is zero. And so what I would observe is that the acceleration that I would measure of this ball would be in agreement with the acceleration that somebody on the bus would measure on the ball. So if I did an experiment, let's say the bus is moving at some speed v in the horizontal direction. If I drop a ball and I measure the acceleration to the gravity, the person on the bus and this person will agree on the value. In fact, Newton's second law, ma, 
F equals MA will be agreement in both reference frames. And that's what you've learned already. Okay. So really that's the, the first two slides. But let me say something about Newton's second law. The net force on a system really has the same value in every inertial frame. When you say F equals MA, that value MA has this, is the same whether the reference frame is stationary or it's moving. And in reality, you can't tell which reference frame is moving. You can't do an experiment which tells which frame is moving if they're inertial. And in fact, when the values between two reference frames are the same, you call them invariant. So not only does Newton's second law have the same form, F equals MA, right? No matter what reference frame you're in, it's going to be F equals MA. But it also has the same value. That's not the same for the conservation laws. Okay, the, the conservation laws have the same form, but the values involved in the conservation laws are not the same. Let me give an example. Let's look at conservation of energy. If you look at conservation of energy, let's say the total initial energy equals the total final energy. That's one way to write it. You, you folks remember this equation, right? I can apply this equation whether I'm standing on the ground and let's say I drop an object. Let's apply this equation dropping an object. I can apply this equation whether I'm standing on the ground or I'm in an airplane moving at 500 miles per hour. I can apply this equation. The only difference is these V's are going to be different. The Y initial and the Y final will be different, depending on where you define your zero. So, no, so depending on the reference frame you're in, these values and, and these values will be different. But the conservation law, the form of the equations, the structure of the equations on both sides here are going to be exactly the same no matter what reference frame you're in. That's not only true of conservation of energy, that's also true of conservation of momentum. They'll have the same form in any reference frames, even though each of the values that you plug into the equation might be different. And and I don't know if, you know, if in physics 205, your, your, your first class that you took, your, your um, mechanics class, you did some momentum problems. You might have done the momentum problems in two different reference frames. A lot of times when you, when you do momentum in your, first, in your first physics course, you do the, the conservation momentum problems in a center mass frame, and then you also do them in the lab frame. And you find out that the results give you the same thing. Uh, the results are equivalent, even though the values of the Vs are different. Okay. When the laws of physics have the same form in different reference frames, you say they're covariant. And in, in reality, all the laws of mechanics have the same form in every inertial frame. And that's the principle of Newtonian relativity. They don't have to have the same values. The numbers in these equations don't have to be the same in every reference frame. The exception is Newton's, first, uh, Newton's second law. Okay. So they don't have to have the same value, but they just have to have the same form. Okay. They have to look like this and this on the two sides of the equation. No matter what reference frame you're in, they're going to have the same form.
And you know, this, you might say, well, why is this important? All right, why is this important? And, and of course, this means that this is the principle of Newtonian relativity. It means that absolute motion cannot be detected. If you measure the period of a pendulum in two different inertial frames, you're going to get exactly the same results. So the laws of physics are consistent between different inertial frames. And of course, we're applying the principle of, uh, we're, we're applying the Galilean transformation. But what if you apply the Galilean transformation to Maxwell's equations? If you do so, and we don't, we're not going to do it in this class, so you, you, I, I'm hoping you believe what I'm going to say, that if you apply the Galilean transformations to Maxwell's equations, you'll find that they look different. Not only do the values change, but they look different. And weird things happen when you apply the Galilean transformation. So I'm going to give you an example, but I'm going to modify the example just because I'm trying to save time. Okay. Now the example I'm going to give you is, is uh, I'm going to change the example just for to make life easier for us. Okay. Because I'm going to I'm going to talk about it conceptually. Usually when I do this example that you see on the screen, I, I do I actually a full out calculation, but because of time, because of the compressed time schedule I have right now, I'm going to change this problem. Okay. <coughs> and, 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 and I'm going to apply Galilean relativity to this problem. So suppose we have Two protons, okay, and they're both moving to the right. What speed v? I'm going to call this distance d. I'm going to write down note. This is different because some people don't catch the, catch on to this. Okay, because sometimes they say it and, and they still don't catch it, so I better write this down. Okay, so they're both moving to the right. I want to calculate, I want to know the force on the top object. Due to the bottom one. There's actually two forces that I gotta consider. One is the the electric force, the Coulomb force. And what I like about this problem is the distance between the two at this instant in time, obviously at this instant in this time, they're the same. Or maybe I can put another external force just to keep the distance the same. But let's assume the, the distance between them, the, the two is the same. And I'm looking at, a, at, the, at this instant in time. Obviously, there's an electric force. Given by that expression from Coulomb's law. But there's also a second force because this object is moving. This is producing a magnetic field here. It's almost like a current carrying wire. So this is producing a magnetic field here. And in fact, 
the magnetic field due to a charge is known. Now we didn't talk about this earlier, but we can write down the, the force due to a charge, it looks like this. Okay, and then I can calculate the magnetic force So let's say I calculate these two I get you know I get the electric force and the magnetic force According to my frame Now what if instead I do my calculation in a frame in which I move with these two? So I'm driving my car, I'm in a vehicle and I'm moving at the same speed as those two objects. What happens to this? Wouldn't it stay the same? But I'm moving with the object. What is this? Remember, I'm, I'm measuring. What is the velocity of these two objects relative to the, me if I'm moving with them? Well, one would be zero, one would be double, right? So. But they're moving in the same direction. Oh. Remember, oh, okay. that's why I wrote this on the board. Don't, don't follow yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then it would be zero, right? It would be zero. So it's like a stationary part. So there wouldn't be a magnetic field. There won't be a magnetic force. Okay, so I get, I use two different reference frames and I get um, different forces. And in fact, since you mentioned it, if, if these were going in opposite direction, the, the, the speed would be twice the, twice the value, right? And then this would be doubled. So if these were moving in opposite directions, as in the problem I give on the screen, then this would be doubled. So depending on the reference frame, I'm going to get a different answer. So there's a problem with that. There's, so there's a problem either with E&M or the Galilean transformation. So this is, what, this is the implication of this. Number one, Maxwell theory implies either that Newton's relativity is not valid for electricity and magnetism and is only valid in a special frame. It also can imply that Maxwell's theory is not correct, but the transformation is valid. Or it can imply that Maxwell's theory and the relativity principle is universal, but the Galilean transformation is only approximately correct. It needs to be fixed. It turns out that Newton, well, I mean, not Newton, Einstein, when he started thinking about this problem, he chose C. He started thinking, okay, let's assume C. Where, where can we go from there? Now, Maxwell's contemporary believed that light waves require medium, just like sound waves. The, the physicists were very deterministic, meaning you know there's got to be some sort of cause to produce uh, the effect. You know how do these electromagnetic waves travel through space if there's not a medium? And I'll give you an example: when you take 215 and you talk about mechanical waves, let's say you have a string and you jiggle the string up and down, the only way the wave on the string can propagate, travel through the, through the a rope, is because of the fact that one part of the rope interacts with the other. There's tension in the rope, so one part of the rope pulls on the other. That causes the wave to go through the 
through the rope. When you have sound waves, the, the way sound waves travel through space is because of vibrations, because of collisions between one medium, one part of the medium and the next. For example, with, with, a, with air, with, with sound waves traveling through air, it's because when I speak, there's a pressure change that causes a, a change in the collisions of the molecules outside of my mouth. Okay? And the, those collisions get propagated through the medium. And your ears pick that up. They pick up those vibrations, the variations in pressure, and they convert it to a sound, what you perceive as a sound. Okay? So, so waves at that time were thought of requiring a medium. So um, a lot of folks said, well, this, this medium is, we're going to call it the luminiferous ether. And there was a lot of research done on the ether in those days. And they assumed that the ether was rigid since the speed of light was so large because the speed of light is three times 28 meters per second. The speed of sound is like, you know, uh, 300, uh, 350 meters per second. A big difference. The speed of a wave in a, let's say, the speed of a sound wave really depends on how rigid the medium uh, is. And you'll learn that in 215. And so the speed of light is measured with respect to the ether. That the C value is measured with respect to the ether. If, and if that's the case, then we should be able to measure the speed of uh, light in, in a different reference frame. And so an experiment was carried out by Michelson Morley. They wanted to measure the variation of the speed of light relative to the ether. So they designed a very sensitive experiment to measure this, to measure the shift in the speed of light. And guess what? They didn't measure anything. They, they couldn't get anything measurable. And the apparatus, and I don't have time to go through the details, involved using the concept of interference, which you'll learn next semester. It's, a, it's, a, it's, an, incredibly, it's an incredible device, which is used a lot now in optics. Okay, it's called an interferometer, and it looks at the interference between waves. And they, they, they uh, carried out this experiment several times, and they were able to, they weren't able to see any shift so, so you let the light waves travel in one direction and then another, another direction, and you, you just don't notice any shift in the speed of the wave. Now, when Isaac Newton, I'm sorry, when Albert Einstein was developing his theory, um, some folks say that he used the Michelson-Morley results to uh, come up with his theory, but that's that historical art fact has been is debatable. People have been debating about whether he he used the Michael the results of the Michelson Morley experiment to come up with his ideas. So Einstein thought about it and he really looked at choice C saying maybe the Galilean transformation is approximately correct. So what he said was he came up with two ideas. He calls them they're two postulates because you really can't prove them. He said that all the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. He said that absolute motion cannot be detected. He said the principle of Newtonian relativity not only encompasses mechanics, but all of physics. And, and I should make a comment here. I'm only talking about rel special relativity. His, his discovery in 1905 is special relativity. General relativity involving accelerated frames came in 1914. We're not going to cover that. So the first postulate, okay, let me go back. The first postulate is all the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. His second one, which is very important, is that the speed of light has the same value independent of the reference frame. Okay. By the way, up to now, neither of his two claims have been able to be disproven. 
although it's very difficult to be able to measure the speed of it's, it's very hard to, it's very hard to prove these two because it's very hard to measure the speed of light with respect to another reference frame questions so far those are the two postulates okay and this changed physics So in his paper, he used, in his paper in 1905, he used these ideas to really change the laws of physics. And the implications of the second postulate, it's very important. Just imagine, the speed of light is the same in all reference frames. And really what that means, it turns out what that means, that time, the time interval, between two different events. This is a real effect. That's, and people don't believe this. The time interval between two different events depends on the reference frame you're in. Time is relative. Okay. Sorry. One second. So, let me show you how time is relative. We're going to do a thought experiment. Okay, let's do a thought experiment. Suppose you're on a rocket ship. Okay, let's say you're on a rocket ship. And you shine a light towards a mirror in the rocket ship. So let me draw the rocket ship. In fact, let me draw the rocket ship there. So I'm going to draw it as, as in the notes. And here's a mirror. Okay, and you're an observer on the rocket ship. And we're going to call this the prime frame. We're also going to call this reference frame the prime frame. And just for simplicity, you're just moving in the x direction, okay? One dimensional motion. And you send a beam of light from here to here and it comes back. So you have a light detector so that the beam of light goes towards the mirror and comes back. And let's assume that the distance between the mirror and your, your detector is D. And the question is, how long does it take for the light beam to go from this point to the mirror and back. What is the time interval between those two events? Well, it's distance over time, right? Because speed of light is constant. So the time it takes, we'll call delta T prime, is two times the D over C. Everyone okay with that? Yeah. Now, what about a person that's in a reference frame that's stationary. So you see this thing whizzing by you. What do you observe? So I'm gonna draw, I guess, three pictures. So you're the observer here, and you're going to see at first the light going this way. And then it's going to be down here, the spaceship will be down here somewhere. Here's the mirror. And 
the light will hit up here. That's what the beam is doing to you, right? I did draw this. This is a small arrow. It should be really a short arrow. So this is the release point. This is when it hits the mirror. And I don't have enough space to draw it very symmetric. And this is where it comes back to the detector. That's what you see. Now, this distance is C times, if, if delta T is the time it takes to go from here to here, then the distance from here to here is C times delta T over two. And this distance is C times delta T over two. Right? Yep. Okay. This distance is D. And let's see. Move the screen. This distance is V of the space shift times delta T over 2. And this distance is V of the space shift times delta T over 2. And they're all related because this forms a right triangle and they're all related through the following equation. This squared has to be equal to d squared plus v delta t over 2 squared. I want to solve for delta t. I want to solve for delta t, so I'm going to bring the delta t's over on one side, so I'm going to get c times, uh, well, if I bring, move this to the other side, I'm going to get c squared minus v squared times delta t over 2 squared equals d squared. Okay. And then I'm going to divide both sides by this thing. And so I'm going to get delta t over 2 squared is d squared over c squared minus d squared. And then let me take the square root of both sides. I'm going to just do it here. Okay, then I'm going to multiply by 2. I'm going to, I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to erase this and multiply by 2. I don't want to rewrite everything. So that's delta t. Furthermore, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to pull the, I'm going to pull the c out of the square root. Okay? So I'm going to get this. So let me compare these two equations. What do you see? A longer time has elapsed for the person who's stationary. This person sees the event, the, 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 the time to be between two events to be bigger than this one. By this factor. We're going to call that factor gamma. We're going to call this factor gamma. Okay. Okay. 
So this is delta t. So basically, delta t is delta t prime times gamma. So, Professor? Yeah. I, I guess it's kind of off topic, but this basically disproves the ability to travel back in time, correct? Because then you would, light would be moving faster than the speed of light? Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, in a way it is because if we have to talk about energy, it would take an infinite amount of energy to do that. I mean, if we, if we and, I, you know, and I'm not going to have the time to talk about it, the total energy is this, of an object. And so, yeah, you're right. I mean, if, if, you, hit, if you hit C, this has to be, this is infinite. You require an infinite amount of energy, according to what we know so far, right? This is based on what we know so far. You can't do it. You know, it's, it's possible someone can come along and say, well, these need to be corrected a little bit. So, um, time is slower in a moving frame. Hey, look, this is a real effect, and a lot of people don't believe this, right? They just think it's some mathematical um, manipulation, but this is a real thing. Okay. So this is called time dilation. The observer in a frame that's moving relative to two events says that the clock is the, uh, mo the moving frame runs slower. The observer in the frame that's at rest relative to the two events measures the same measures the two events at the same location in space. The observer that's in a frame moving relative to two events needs two synchronized clocks at two different locations to measure the time interval. By the way, the time that's measured by the person in the space shift is called the proper time because those two events were measured at the same place. So you call it the proper time. Now, let's let L0 be Y2 minus Y1. Let's let it be the distance that the rocket travels between fl flashes according to, whoops, according to the stationary observer. Okay? We're going to call that distance L0. So according to the stationary observer, the, the, the distance the rocket travels in, in uh, the time is L0. And L0 is just V times T. But in a moving frame, time runs slower. In a moving frame, time runs slower. Delta T prime is delta T over gamma. So in a moving frame, the distance between Y1 and Y2 is, is contracted. Y2 prime minus Y1 prime is going to be equal to V times delta T prime. Which is going to give me V times delta T times 1 minus V squared over C squared, which is L naught over gamma. So the person in the rocket is going to see that distance contracted. So distances are shorter.
And I'm expecting my video to be choppy now because I, I just got a note saying my videos, my connection's unstable. So objects, length and lengths of objects are shorter when measured in a moving frame. So if you're in a super fast car and you look at a ruler outside, outside of your car that's, that's stationary, it's going to appear shorter to you. The length of an object that's measured in the frame in which the object is at rest is called a proper length. And Laurent and Fitzgerald used the idea to explain the result of the Michelson Morley uh, experiment. But uh, um, there's some folks who came later on, right? 1932, they actually disproved it. So, what is evidence? What is, where's some evidence for this stuff? Length gets contracted, and time changes in different reference frames. So I'll give you an example of this. There are muons that are up in your upper atmospheres, okay? And these muons are created because of the decay of an esoteric particle called pion. And we could detect them. We have detectors to measure them. And the muons decay, the muons decay, oops, hold on a second, let me change my, okay, the muons decay exponentially with time. If you've learned about radioactive decay, for example, you've seen an equation like this before. So the muons decay in the following fashion. This is what you started with. And tau is just the, the decay time. Tau for a muon, for a muon, tau is about two microseconds. Okay. Now, muons are, are moving very fast through the atmosphere. Muon speed are approximately 0.998 times the speed of light. Okay? So, let's assume, let me call this N0. This is what I started with. Let's assume we have a bunch of muons. Let's say we have 10 to the 8th muons in the upper atmosphere. Okay, so let n naught then n equals 10 to the 8th e to the minus t over 2 microseconds. And so we can actually detect how many particles we have after a certain time period has, has, uh, has gone by. Now these muons, they come, the, you, can, you can actually measure these muons from around 9,000 meters above the atmosphere, 9,000 meters above the earth. So let's say these muons Are this far above the earth. Okay. So how long do they take to get to the ground? Well, the time it takes, so the time it takes It's going to be distance over velocity. So let's take the distance over the velocity. So the time then that's elapsed. So let's say you have this many at 9,000 meters. How many are there when you reach the Earth's surface? So you're going to have the time that's elapsed is going to be 9,000 meters 
divided by 0.9 um, 98C. And this comes out to be about uh, 30 microseconds, approximately, okay? It's approximately 30 microseconds. That's how long it takes for these particles to um, reach the Earth's surface. So how many are left? So I'm going to do n equals 10 to the eighth e to the minus 30 microseconds over 2 microseconds. That gives me 10 to the eighth e to the minus 15, which is about uh, 30 muons. So you would only expect 30 of them left by the time they get here. So you wouldn't expect that many muons at our surface. But that's not the case. If you do an experiment, you will find there's tens of millions of them. Not 30. There's way more than what you would expect. A lot more than what you would expect. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons for it. Okay. We can explain it both ways. To a muon, that 9,000 meters is contracted. So to a muon, Length is contracted. So that 9,000 meters gets reduced. Now, what's gamma? Gamma is going to be 1 over 1 minus 0.998c over c, the whole thing squared, and I take the square root. This comes out to about 15. So you take 900 and divide it by 15, uh, 9,000 divided by 15, you get 600. So they only think, they only observe that this is to be 600 meters. So how long does it take to go 600 meters? Well, it's two microseconds. So really what I should be putting in here is two microseconds. It's only one, one time constant. The only one time constant has elapsed. That's why this is way off. I mean, it's really way off. I mean, you're comparing 30 to tens of millions. Another way to look at it is this. 30 microseconds have elapsed according to us. But time runs slower in the reference frame of the muon. Time runs slower in the reference frame of the muon. By how much? Well, it's decreased by gamma. So what's 30 over 15? It's 2. So only 2 microseconds have elapsed. So what should be up here to the muon is 2. And so instead of having 30 left, you have this many left. Which is about 37 million. And that's pretty much what you detect. You're not going to detect 30. It would be very hard to detect 30, but you can detect this many very easily. Okay? You have to count for a long period of time to get a, a good statistics on that. So this is evidence for time dilation. This is actually evidence for both time dilation and length contraction. So suppose... I'm going to do, let's see, two more examples. So let me check the time. I'm going to do two more examples. 
and then I'll stop. So suppose you have um, astronauts in the spaceship traveling at 0.6 C past the Earth. They sign off space control saying that they're going to take a nap for one hour and call back. How long is that one hour on Earth? So these two people on a spaceship, they're going really fast. Okay, they're going really fast. And so on a spaceship, they nap for one hour. And that's delta T prime. Okay. Gamma, let's calculate gamma. Gamma is going to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. It's going to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.6c over c squared which is 1 over the square root of 0.64 squared, uh, 0.64. Okay, and this comes out to be 1.25. So, delta T is gamma delta T prime. So this is 1 hour, this is 1.25. So the people on the spaceship observe, I'm sorry, the people on Earth observe that 1.25 hours have elapsed. Two people of the same height pass each other in different elevators. According to relativity, what do they conclude about each other's heights? What do you think they would say? Well, they would say they're both shorter than actual, wouldn't they? Yeah, who's correct? Mm. Neither one because they're relative to each other, but not relative to Earth, I guess. Actually, they're both correct. Right? It's, based on, it's based on your reference frame. Even the time, the, the, the values for T, they're both, I mean, the T's are, are, are correct based on the reference frame you're in. That's the point here is that time, distance, that's all relative. So, in the problem with the people napping, the, in the reference frame of the people who are napping, their nap took an hour. But on Earth, the nap took an hour and a quarter. If you had clocks, physical clocks, measuring time on Earth and in that spaceship, one would read one hour, the one on Earth would read one and a quarter hours. You can get a clock a cesium a clock based on atomic transitions in cesium and the two clocks would register different values the closest to actually doing this people have actually tried this experiment the closest they've ever done this is they they actually had an experiment where they took these people on an airplane and I, I, I think they flew for 24 hours. And they compared, and they had a clock, cesium clock, because cesium clocks are the most precise clocks, most accurate clocks on the planet. And um, they compared the clocks between the ones from the airplane, the cesium clock on the airplane, and the cesium clocks on Earth. Now, the effect is small because the airplane's not moving very fast compared to the speed of light. And so they got uh, a time difference, and you got to correct for general relativity too. The time difference between the two clocks 
of the order of like um, 50, to, 50 to 60 nanoseconds over a period of 24 hours. The people on the plane, their clock ran slower by like 50 to 60 nanoseconds. It was a real thing. And so the time is, based on your reference frame, it's correct. There is no absolute time. That's the point here. There is no absolute time. What is absolute is this weird quantity that, that connects space and time. Now, the, the thing I'm going to talk about, and I wish I had time to do it today, but the thing I'll talk about in the lab on, on Monday is the fact that if you observe two results that are simultaneous in one reference frame, they will not be simultaneous in the other. Okay. Two events that, are simul that occur at the same time in one reference frame will not occur at the same time in the other. But you have to, in order to actually think about this, you have to think about you know, how our clocks synchronize. So we've got to talk about both things. So Monday, I'm going to talk about this example involving simultaneity. These are all the implications of Einstein's postulates. And these are all real effects which people have a hard time believing, okay? So we'll talk about it. And, and, I, and I have this example written. Now I, I've done it two different ways. And depending on time, I might, I, might, I might only do it one way. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. And then we'll use the lab. So on Monday in lab, I'm going to talk about simultaneity. And I'll talk um, about the... the um, Lorentz transformation. I'm not going to derive them. I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you what they are. And really, that's all I can say about relativity. The results are very bizarre. Completely contrary to your experiences. Quantum physics is the same. Okay. So uh, I'm going to stop here.